My name is Andre. I work in Uber, New York. I'm an SRE, which means I'm as far away as possible from our users. Uh, and that's what I wanted. So uh, today I was going, and I'm still going, to talk about uh, some um, computer magic. So uh, I usually like to structure my talks in such a way that there is a problem, and then we solve the problem. And that's probably what I'm going to do today. So the problem. Uh, so the problem is actually uh, it has many facets in it, right? So, but if if I would like to say that in a few words, then uh, the problem is that it's not fast enough. So in Uber, we run a lot of microservices. We are heavily uh, service oriented. We have more than a thousand microservices in production right now, and this number grows every day. Uh, I think the correlation is that every time we hire a new developer, we have like three new microservices or something like that. And uh, these microservices run all around the place. They are written in different languages. We have Golang, Node.js, Python, Java, C, everything. And at this scale and at this fan out, uh, that means that if you call some microservice, it will probably call some other microservices, and they call some other microservices, and in the end, you'll have this huge fan out. And if some of these microservices run slow, everything runs slow, and users will suffer. So uh, I work on the observability team in Uber, and that's the team that's responsible for all the metrics and everything like that. And we run the, uh, our metric collection system. It's written in Golang, and it serves some insane number of requests per second. And we've noticed that for like a good slice of its runtime, it does something that's not supposed to do. Instead of doing all this metric stuff, it does things like collecting garbage and switching contexts and stalling on memory accesses and this and that. And we thought that we can do better than that. Uh, and we did. So uh, apart from obvious things that people do with Golang, as in like pulling everything, do not allocate anything, uh, use GoRoutine worker pools and everything like that. Uh, we've noticed another thing, which I'm going to talk about today. So to explain what it is, I am going to talk a little bit about computers. But before that, I figured that a very good way to keep people here and not walking out the door in the middle of a talk is to show you benchmarks first. That's the benchmarks. So uh, before Magic, it worked like this. So basically, for, for example, Go 1.5 for compute heavy loads, like calculating things, like for example, hashing or something like that, it was about 100 requests per second, and now it's almost 200 requests per second. For, for example, running Nginx, which serves some static pages, it was about 150,000 requests per second served, now it's about 180 uh, with magic. So that's the point of this talk, the magic, right? So uh, to explain the magic, let's talk about computers a little bit. So computers are complicated. That's, that's uh, the sad reality. So uh, maybe 10 years ago, computers were very simple. You just have a CPU, some memory, some disk. That's it. It works. Everybody understands what's going on. Uh, but it's not the case anymore. And what we have now is this massively multi-core, multi-socket uh, processors and computers with uh, deep cache hierarchies. The cache is growing up to like tens of megabytes. Uh, we have very complicated uh, out of our execution pipelines. which try to predict what's going to happen in the program. And sometimes it fails. Sometimes it works. But anyway, that's, that's complicated. And uh, the consequence of this complication is that when you run your program on some uh, beefy enough server, you can end up having different results when running it again and again without any obvious reason for this to happen. And unfortunately, all the tools that hardware uh, manufacturers give us, like, for example, PMU or PBS, which are like all these performance counters and whatever, is only used by Brandon Gregg from Netflix, and nobody else uses them. So, uh, yeah, let's. Oh, yeah, that's one of the famous uh, engineers. He said this a while ago. So let's uh, look at this cryptic diagram. 
So what do you think it is? Any ideas? Cheesecake. OK. Cassandra. Well, to me, it looks like a network diagram. We have four servers. We have some data stores attached to them. Uh, we have some router, some tape storage there, and some connection to the internet or top of the rack switch or something like that. Uh, so if I put some labels on it, that would look like this, right? So we have some servers. We have some SAS boxes, some SSDs, some tape, some router, some network, and whatever. But at the same time, I can replace the labels. And then it looks like a server. We have some cores. We have some memory attached to these cores. We have some peripheral hub. We have some disks attached to this hub and some Ethernet controller, something like that. So if you think about it, it doesn't really look very different nowadays. I mean, before that, it was very different. But now, it is actually not. Uh, each core of your system is basically a separate computer that is attached with a very, very fast network to other cores. But some of the cores attached with slow network because they're in different physical boxes. But it's, in the end, all the same anyway. So unfortunately, I don't have the next slide here, so I don't know what I'm talking about next. Let's see. That's it. It's complicated. So, uh, and given this picture, if you keep this in mind, then you can realize that uh, we have many different components interconnected with different buses and different interlinks. And performance characteristics of each of these links and if each of these components are different. And uh, all this caching and all, all, all the uh, queuing and buffers and offload techniques and everything, it makes the computers the more modern computer is very untransparent. You can't really understand what's going on in them right now. And uh, that makes things complicated as well for us so software engineers and SREs, because when we run our programs on these computers, we can probably like slightly predict what's going to happen. Maybe we can use some tools like flame graph, something like that. And that can happen us, uh, can help us understand what's going on. But not very many people actually use it, and not very many people understand what's going on. So uh, that's the problem. We have this problem, and this problem leads us to the fact that our programs don't run as fast as they could run, given the hardware they run on. Uh, so yeah, the same engineer said this, too. Basically, yeah, computers, a network, and a chip, literally. So the solution to this problem. And I put this solution in quotes for a reason. Uh, the solution that the industry came up so far is a little bit weird, because the solution is to kind of resort to wishful thinking and just not think about it. It's fine, right? Uh, so modern languages, and I, I took Golang here, but it actually applies to Python and to Node.js and Java and C++ and it, it, it to everything, basically. Uh, these uh, modern languages and modern runtimes, they kind of expect that the operating system will take care of it, and they just don't care about it themselves. So they just ask the OS and the kernel to do the scheduling, do the memory location for them, and that's it, right? It will just kind of happen in itself. And you will never believe what happened next. This happened next. This is just one of the examples of things that happen in production. So this is the actual Golang issue. Uh, you can go to GitHub and look, look it up with this number. So what happened in this case, for example, and I took this one because it's so ridiculous. There are more like this. Is that Golang garbage collector collects so much garbage that Linux NUMA controller, NUMA, NUMA uh, memory manager, thinks that this is the actual work. <laughs> and all the memory pages migrate to this NUMA node. And then they migrate back and then back and forth and like that. And that basically kills memory performance. And there are more examples of this kind of uh, thing happening in computers in every language, in every framework, and basically every aspect of uh, modern software engineering. And people don't really think about it. They just think that, OK, this thing runs with this speed. And maybe we can change some branches in, this, in, the, in, the, in the program, or maybe we can migrate to some better framework or whatever. But they don't think uh, about that this software runs on hardware. And this hardware is actually complicated. And sometimes it's much more complicated than the software. So 
uh, what's next? Yeah, another cryptic diagram. So this diagram is the goal length runtime in, in a nutshell, very, very high level overview. So here we see these EMS. EMS in Golang terminology is the meshing thread. That's the thread that Golang runtime will spawn to run GoRoutines. So the number of uh, these hardware meshing threads is somewhere around GoMax prox, but not exactly the same number. Basically, it should stay the number of GoMax prox, but every time you make a syscall, it will spawn a new meshing thread because the previous one is locked and waiting for the syscall to return. Uh, so this number kind of grows and contracts a little bit over the runtime of the program. And these blue things here is the uh, P's, which are processors in Go terminology. These are the actual things that run Go routines. They have run queue and memory cache. Run queue is the, the, is the uh, queue of Go routines to be run on this P, and M cache is the cache of the memory allocator. And also we have M heap, which is the actual memory heap we have to allocate memory from, and we also have NetPol, which is the thing that pulls sockets and everything, it does all the I.O. So I tried to depict here that these things are not related at all with color and shapes and everything. So what happens is that, for example, you need to run some Go routine, some code. Uh, this Go routine stays on the run queue, one of the P's, and the Go runtime tries to schedule this P on some of the M's. It finds some M, the Go routine runs on M, when it blocks because of some I.O. or something else, because the uh, time quanta is out, some, so for example, it gets descheduled and put in the run queue again. And next time we need to schedule it, it will put on some other M, and it will allocate memory from other cache. All kind of stuff will happen like this. So uh, there is a paper, actually, like a proposal in Goran time that I think is aimed for like 1.8 or something like that. I, I don't think it's actually versioned right now, which is titled like make go runtime uh, hardware aware. And that's interesting because I thought it is hardware aware. <laughs> so uh, this paper basically states that, states that, states that the go runtime right now makes almost zero effort to understand the topology of the hardware and it just tries to run as best as they can. And that's the whole effort it, it actually makes. I think actually it does one thing, it tries to uh, acquire the same M after a quick syscall, but syscall is not the thing that is quick, so it probably never happens. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and this, this wishful thinking is not, I mean, it could be uh, a lesser evil if it was only to, ex to the extent that we just don't care about hardware, let the operating system take care of it, but software engineering community decided to make it even worse by adding more and more layers of abstractions, over-engineering everything we can, and adding multiple layers of direction every time we get at it. So basically, the modern stack is something like we have a VM from AWS. On top of that, we run Docker. In Docker, we run some uh, virtual machine of a language, like Java, for example, or Go Runtime. And then we have 25 frameworks. And on top of the frameworks, we have our own abstractions. And it's really hard to tell what happens when the uh, the program runs because it has to go down and up through all this kind of multi-layered pie of abstractions we've put into the code. And yeah, uh, I think the level of abstraction, as I said there, is as far away from real hardware as we are from planting potato on Mars. I've only seen that in the movie, so it's probably not true. And it's not gonna happen. So, unless Elon Musk does something good. So I figured that I'm probably not really able to change this status quo and kind of make that everybody starts to think about hardware. So I came up with a workaround. And workaround is what SREs do. I'll, we'll just wait for software engineers to figure out the real way to solve this problem. But for now, a workaround. So the workaround is to make programs computer friendly in such a way that we don't need to touch programs. Uh, and to explain how this magic works, I'm gonna introduce three things which are very common and everybody here knows about it, but if you combine them, it kind of starts to look very interesting. So sharding, first of all, sharding. So usually when we talk about sharding, uh, we talk about like database sharding, right? We have some data, we're gonna shard it by key, or like user ID or geo or something like that. 
and we have many shards of the database. And this is the uh, quote from Wikipedia. It says that, uh, yeah, basically it says what I just said, right? But in fact, we can shard whatever we want because the concept of sharding is not really tied to databases. We can shard anything. And we actually already do this when we put a load balancer in front of our application, right? Because we have many shards of the app and each shard serves a portion of traffic. And in this case, the shard sharding key is basically the address of the source and the address of the destination, right? So keep that in mind, we can chart anything we want. Uh, load balancing. So this is another quote from Wikipedia. Uh, load balancer is something that we put in front of our stuff so that we could uh, maximize throughput, optimize resource use, minimize response time, and do all these cool things. But normally when we talk about load balancers, we talk about networking, right? We have some kind of backends. We put load balancer in front of backends. And that's it. That's the load balancing. But in fact, we can do this on the local machine. We can spawn multiple instances of the app. We can put a load balancer in front of them and pretend that each core is a machine on the network. Uh, and this is kind of true considering what I've just said and all these cryptic diagrams before. So it should work. And the third thing is hardware locality. So uh, I heard many times when people talk about NUMA and CPU cores and CPU pinning and hyperthreading and all the kind of stuff, but that's usually, that usually ends with talking like, yeah, we know about NUMA. Good. <laughs> that, we, that means we're better engineers for some reason. Uh, but what we can actually do is that we could use this terrain, right? So uh, if somebody here played things like, I don't know, StarCraft, for example, or some other strategy game, you know that terrain is very important. If you put your tank on top of a hill, you will win everybody. If you don't do this, you will die. <laughs> so uh, I thought that's a very good idea to actually use the terrain in computer engineering because we have terrain too, right? We have these data paths that connect cores together. We have these memory nodes connecting to each other, and whatever. This is terrain, right? So if we put our application on a hill that is close to memory, that probably means that it will access memory faster, and that's a good thing. So uh, this is called CPU pinning, and uh, Docker supports this already. So one of the uh, options you can specify when you run a container in this like huge JSON you can specify for Docker is CPU pinning, memory nodes you, can, you want to attach your container to, and other things, CPU shares and whatnot. So Docker already supports that, but it's kind of hidden very well. It's so deep, it's impossible to find it. Uh, but I found it. So, <laughs> and while you think about it, we can do even more interesting things. Uh, apart from doing CPU pinning or memory pinning, we can, for example, pin our apps closer to the node that is closer to the, to the Beats PCH, which is the uh, hardware bridge, so that it's closer to the network adapter. So that means this node, that the, the, uh, the app that does all the I.O. and whatnot is closer to the network, and then it shares data with some other instance, which runs on some other core that can do some computations and whatnot. So if you combine these things together, then you basically will have a system that will uh, analyze the hardware of the server, figure out what's where, where the nodes are, where the cores are, how many memory, how much memory we have, how many nodes we have, what kind of cores are there, because we have hyperthreading, we have normal cores, some cores belong to one socket and whatnot. And then it can use Docker to spawn multiple instances of the app and pin these instances to cores or NUMA nodes or something like that and then it could set up some kind of local load balancing in front of it. And from the point of view of a client from some other host or whatever, it will look like it's just same app, right? It just listens on the port 80, for example, and that's it. Uh, but what will happen actually is that it will be many instances. They will run each on each own, its own core, and the load balancer will figure out the kind of sharding for it. So I did that. I wrote this tool. It's here. Uh, it's on GitHub. I never actually tried this core code, so I don't know really where it leads. <laughs> but it should lead to GitHub. So uh, it's a very extremely simple Go tool. 
uh, what it does is that it analyzes the uh, topology by using a library from OpenMPI project, figures out what cores we have and everything like that. Then it uses local Docker to spawn multiple instances of the image that you specified. And then it pins it to whatever you want, which is cores or NUMA nodes or what, whatnot. And then it sets up a load balancer in front of that. And it uses the GORP project for the load balancing, which is the thing that I presented on the uh, Barcelona DockerCon. And this thing is basically, the GORP thing, is the uh, HTTP frontend for APVS. And APVS is the thing that powers Docker Swarm now. So it's sort of like a toy version of Swarm for a local machine, kind of. I don't know. Uh, uh, so I'm going to do a demo and show you how it works. How about that? So I, this is, AWS, uh, this is AWS. So I have two machines running here. One is server, which is like a beefy 4X large 16 cores box. Uh, I'm gonna stay here. And there's also a client, which is like a smaller box with not so much cores and whatnot. So I'm not very good at, with AWS, so probably there are some cool command line tools which I didn't know about. You can't see anything, right? Better? Cool. Uh, so, I didn't actually realize that this conference is on the West Coast. So I started these machines on the East Coast. Uh, so yeah, that's the box. Uh, so, so that you believe me that I'm not lying to you, this is the CPU info for this box. It has 16 cores. We can count them if you want. <laughs> Do you trust me that it's a 16 core box? Good. So uh, on this box, I have this super simple test app written in Go, so it's extremely straightforward. It basically takes an HTTP request, disregards anything in this HTTP request, and then hashes current time 100,000 times and returns it. And this is kind of a very bad approximation for CPU-intensive task, but it's good enough for this demo. Uh, that's it, there's nothing else. So we're gonna build it, and we're gonna make a Docker container of that. So that's it. We have this image test. We can run it. Uh, actually, it was built 40 minutes ago. So for the cleanliness of this experiment, I'm going to remove it and build it again. Done. Um, actually, I need more. No, I don't want to translate that. Okay, so this is the box. This is the same box. Another SSH session. I'm going to open top here so that you can see what's going on. So I'm going to start this container right now. Uh, no, that's not the start. Where was it? Nope. Yep. So run the container, expose port 80. That's the image name I just built. So you can run it, it runs. So you can see it here, Docker did something, and now it's somewhere in the bottom of this top. Now I'm going to go to the client machine. That's big enough. Okay, so here I have uh, WRK, which is like a C-based uh, HTTP kind of load testing tool. And I'm just gonna hit the other node, and this is the IP of other nodes, so, so, so that it is actually this the same IP address here, 5133. Uh, 
So it tells it to run 1,000 connections in 16 threads for 30 seconds with a timeout of 10 seconds and hit just port 80 of the same box. So if we run this, uh, this test for 30 seconds, it will show us some numbers that it took it, I don't know, how many requests per second and everything like that. So let's wait for 30 seconds. It's going to end soon. Hang on. It's al almost done. Somewhere in Amazon, some server is now working really hard. Come on. Almost. OK, so here's the results, right? So 133 requests per second, 400 timeouts, some distribution of latency and requests per seconds, and basically it worked, and that's what we have. So now I'm going to stop this thing and use the tool that I just told you about. So the tool is already here, but I can do go get again if you want. Uh, OK. Well, I can't. Let's, like, actually, I can, right? I still have time. Go path is this. You can do the same thing. It's on GitHub. Uh, well, maybe there's some bug. I've worked before. I think it just pulled some new version of Docker API, and there is some change in the API, which is a bad thing to do, Jerome. You don't change API. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it worked yesterday. So uh, I'm going to do two things here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start the uh, load balancer. No, that's not it. Yep, so it runs the thing that I've presented on, on the Barcelona DockerCon. So basically, it's just the thing that sits on HTTP and listens for requests. And with this request, you can create a virtual service, you can add backends, all this kind of normal uh, load balancing stuff. It listens on some port. Uh, and I'm going to use the uh, tool I just presented to do this. So it says that. So Tesson is a tool name. It's a command line tool. It's not a daemon or anything like that. It says that Tesson used this GORB uh, endpoint, which is localhost with a port, and run the test container and expose port 80. Uh, Tesson, by the way, is a French word that means a shard of glass. I, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, so what it does, basically, is that it, it detected the topology of this Amazon box. Uh, it has 16 cores. And it started eight containers because it detected that each second core is a hyperthreading core, so it's not a real core, so it doesn't actually it, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to pin to a hyperthreading core. Uh, so it bound each instance to uh, two cores, right? And it contacted GORB to expose the service as a virtual service on IPVS locally as well. And that's the GORB logs saying that it created all these virtual services, started health checking and everything like that. And now we're going to hit the same thing again, same port 80, and wait another 30 seconds with this awkward silence. Ah, <laughs> uh, OK. I'll just run it again with the top. Mm. Well, it works now, see? Uh, it just ended, but... <laughs> <laughs> you've, 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 you've kind of caught the glimpse of it, right? There was eight processes running. I can run again. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is this number. It's 220 requests per second, as opposed to 133. Uh, I didn't change any code at all. I just ran the same thing, but with tests on, eight instances pinned to CPU cores. It's not a 100% gain, but it's like 70% for free. And that's pretty cool, I think. And the only thing I did is... <laughs> yeah, the only, thing, the only thing I did is just it, it kind of took into account that there is a hardware 
that we actually use. The code is not running in the virtual space. Uh, do you still want to see top? Okay. So run it again. Here is top. I, I don't know what to expect to see here. It, it works. <laughs> this exe thing is the Docker proxy, because local load balancer goes to local container through a proxy. That's not a really good thing, and uh, it can be eliminated by using the uh, Mac VLAN network plugin for Docker, which is now in experimental. But I've, uh, I've been talking to somebody from Docker today, and they said that it will be released like pretty soon. So once it's released, I'll just change the normal like default networking, which is virtual Ethernet based, to Mac VLAN, and Docker proxy will go away as well. Uh, so this was obviously my best demo. 75% gain, right? Uh, so uh, it, it, it works that good when we're talking about CPU intensive tasks, like number crunching, hashing, or something like that. Uh, I specifically didn't put Python and Node.js in the comparison chart because the chart is like this. It's like 5,000% faster. Uh, because Go at least makes some effort to understand what's going on. Uh, and across the board, if you like, take normal workload without some specific, uh, specific things like CPU intensive, memory intensive, whatever, then across the board, the gain is like 10, 15% for free, which is pretty cool when this tool is up on GitHub, you can just download it and use it in your companies and just, I don't know, save money. So yeah, let's make programs computer friendly again. Thank you. If you have some questions before we go to the closing keynote featuring cool hacks and, and stuff like that, now is the time. Just out of curiosity, what happens if you run that, um, the Go app outside of Docker? Uh, sorry, what? What happens if you run the Go app you built outside of Docker? Is it going to use all the cores anyway? Uh, there is a little performance gain, but Docker is a very, very lightweight wrapper. So basically, if, if I run only one instance without the Docker, the number will be like, instead of 133, it will be like 141 or something like that. But you won't see like 100% gain. It's a very, very thin wrapper. It doesn't go, doesn't automatically use all the cores then? No, uh, actually, I can, I can show you later. So if you run one yeah. app, it actually consumes all the cores as well. Okay, that's what I mean. Yeah, it it's, it's not that it runs only one core, because that would be like super cheating, and you can just throw chairs at me or something like that. <laughs> so it, it actually tries to consume all the cores, but I can show you it later. So what happens is that uh, it consumes like 1,400% of CPU which means that other like 300% of CPU, it's, it's busy doing something that I, I, I'm not, I, I don't want it to do, which is like context switching, some GC, some this and that, something not really useful. Uh, thanks for the talk, it was really awesome. So I have uh, que two questions. So first of all, you're running, two, you're running eight Go apps instead of one, so there's gonna be some memory overhead, I'm guessing. Uh, have you done any, you know, amortized analysis, seeing if this actually consumes more memory, but it's it's giving more throughput? And the second one is, uh, can we take the gorb out and uh, just convert this thing into some uh, Docker run commands and give let Swarm do the load balancing? Okay, so when I did this, I didn't know about SwarmKit. So now, since we know that there is SwarmKit, it probably can be like plugged into SwarmKit somehow. I don't know how. And if you take a look at the code, this, the, the code is kind of the, the load balancer thing is abstracted away, so you can implement something else, like it can generate Nginx configs, for example, or something like that. It will just work the same way. Uh, and for the question about memory overhead, the thing that happens with Golang, actually, if, when you run eight instances, it actually consumes less memory and there is less overhead. <laughs> because pro, I, I guess the memory allocator in Go kind of tries to allocate some big, big chunks of memory to reuse them later, like put them into caches, something like that. So when you run eight instances, it actually consumes less memory, and it's, there's less overhead because GC doesn't need to hit in so often. I was wondering, uh, I'm sure you must have tested this at some point, what is the difference between if you run eight instances of your Golang container 
behind Gorb, but don't pin them to specific uh, cores is what's the difference between that and pinning the eight I actually cores? didn't try that. Oh, really? OK. No. Just curious. I mean, the, the point, uh, the, the idea behind the talk was that if we pin something and we don't pin something. I guess that, I don't know, actually, I, I would like to try. I'll try, I'll try after this talk. So I was going to ask, um, obviously, we don't live in an ideal world where we pick our own hardware and we just kind of get hardware and you know, make it do what we want. Um, have you put any thought into reconstructing the idea of how we get our hardware and how our hardware is structured and organized? I don't really understand the question. So if you could make your own computer from scratch, like, oh, I can't. and, and re release it to the masses, <laughs> right? Like, like we have this issue with our hardware where we don't understand what it's doing and it's extremely complex and it's well, not I, transparent. Well, I, I, I don't really, I don't, can't really answer this question because I'm probably too dumb for that. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I can say about this is that in the future it will be actually worse because the uh, Basically, the way CPUs evolve is that they can't raise the, uh, the clock speed anymore, so they add more and more cores, but the memory speed cannot uh, keep up with this raise, with this, with this advancement in CPU core count and everything. So what's going to happen probably, I think, is that for each core, there will be more than one Numa node eventually, and that will make things even worse because you really, really want to pin things in this case. Basically, I, I don't understand why it doesn't happen now because if you think f about something like Mesos, for example, you literally give hints to the system about what you want to achieve from your topology, right? You tell it that I want this to be local to that, I want this to be local to this, I want it to be like this and whatever. But when you run things on one computer, we just don't care. <laughs> whatever. Well, thanks a lot, Andre, uh, and we'll see you all at the closing keynote. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>